Thank you for being here with us today, and please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Seitz. Yes, I, 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 dissertation most deadly was uh, uh, something that I did for procrastination while I was writing my own. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, people used to ask me, how's the writing going? And I would say, oh, very well. I just killed someone else. <laughs> and um, they loved it. Um, it was, it was great that Deirdre mentioned Manuel de Falla because I started to, um, when, when you try to pick a dissertation topic, you know you're gonna be living with it for a really long time. And I remember saying to my advisor, I want to live in Paris at the turn of the century. Um, and uh, I got to. And it is one of my absolute favorite time periods for music. It is a time when um, kind of everything changed. And it was a time of great intersection between art and poetry and music. And in particular, and I'm not going to be speaking about Manuel de Falla now, um, but in particular, I think, um, it is the time of the birth of modernism in music. So I thought I would start by kind of asking why we call this time period in French music Impressionism and what it was wh when that term really actually first came about. And of course, as you all know, and I'm sure you've been to uh, the Toulouse-Lautrec here, um, it really began with painters. And uh, especially these three started that cooperative so uh, society of painters, sculptors, and engravers. And uh, they were to spend 60 francs a year to be, belong to the society, and then they would present together. And they started this society in 1873, and in April of 1874, they had their first showing. And some of the most important paintings in that showing is Degas at the Races, which, by the way, did not sell. Pissarro's Orchard in Bloom, which did not sell. And Monet's Impression Sunrise, which did not sell. And it was from this painting that the critics started using the term Impressionism for this group of artists, even though they have very different approaches. Um, I think that this one was, was particularly noticeable. Um, everyone uh, at the time said one of the reasons perhaps that this did not sell was it was overpriced at a thousand francs. I would love to buy it for a thousand <laughs> francs. I, I could send my kid to college. Um, but what they were trying to do is something very akin to what the composers were trying to do and what the poets were trying to do at that same time. And in fact, in the late April, there was a, a critic who wrote this, if one wants to characterize them with a single word that explains their efforts, one would have to create the new term impressionists, and it stuck. And so we have this group of, of painters that now have the title. So how did it get transferred to music? And it gets transferred fairly quickly, actually, to music with this guy. Um, Debussy started his career, he, he came from a non-musical family, kind of lower class, um, and he started at the Paris Conservatoire actually quite young. Uh, when he was about 10 or 11 years old, he started at the Conservatoire. And when he was there, he was really mainly a pianist. Not, he was not a, uh, a composer. And after taking harmony and counterpoint classes, he switched to composition. And they were actually kind of displeased with him because he kept breaking all the rules. And um, he, would, he would be 
told, you know, this sounds very pretty, but you're not following the rules of harmony. You're not following the rules of counterpoint. And you're, you're having all of these strange sounds, sounds that don't really make sense to us, sounds from the past. And Debussy took no heed. Um, and while he, was at uh, uh, while he was at the Conservatoire, he starts to try in his late teens, early 20s, to win this prize called the Prix de Rome, the Rome Prize. And now the Rome Prize is an interesting one. You have to, um, you have to go through several stages already. Um, first, you have to prove that you could write counterpoint, so they would give you a fugal subject, and then you write a fugue in a couple of hours and hand it in, and then they grade it, and if you do well, you get to the next section, then to the next. And finally, the very last, is that they give you a text for a uh, vocal and orchestral work, a cantata, and everybody gets the same text, and then they get put into a room for a couple of weeks, and you're supposed to stay there for several weeks and work on this during the day, take dinner at night, go to bed, and get up and finish a cantata. Well, Debussy got to the cantata stage once, didn't make it, and then the second time actually made the Rome Prize, and he won. And he said he won because the second time through, he decided not to write anything that he liked, but to write everything that they would like. <laughs> and he wins it. Now what's important about the Rome Prize, there's a whole bunch of things that's important about it. Number one, you get two years all expenses paid at the Villa Medici in Rome, which isn't bad. <laughs> the second thing that you get is a guaranteed performance of the work that you produce while in those two years. And so you have to keep sending pieces back or sending art back or whatnot to prove that you're not just hanging out in Rome drinking red wine and eating pasta and that you're actually working on your craft and working, you know, um, uh, producing something. So Debussy, at this time, he starts he starts writing, and he starts writing a lot home. He gets very homesick. And I must say, um, a lot of the composers that you can imagine who were French, uh, people like Gounod and Massenet and Bizet and, and um, Berlioz, all won at some point or another the Rome Prize. And all of them complain about Rome, which is shocking to me, because when I went to Rome, I was like, I will stay here for two years, thank you very much, especially all, all, all expenses paid. But Debussy writes home a lot, but he often talks about what he is trying to accomplish in his music. And I thought I would show you how awful they had it. On the left there, <laughs> that's the Villa Medici, um, and you get your own room, and you get room and board, and then you can travel into, if you see in the distance, you can travel into Rome. And in fact, it's here that he actually has a lifelong love of the Renaissance composer Palestrina. He talks about Palestrina an awful lot in his letters. And he loves to go to church services and listen to chant, and listen to early music, which I find very fascinating because I think it winds up in his music. Here's a picture of some of the Pre de Rome paid, uh, the Pre de Rome winners. And if you look on the, that very dapper guy with the hat on the top, that's Debussy. Um, and um, this was the group as they were there. And he sent back one of his early, uh, early orchestral works with, with um, chorus. Uh, that later gets reorchestrated without chorus. But this is what he writes home, what he's trying to do. And he says this, and I've got this in number one if you want to follow along, but you don't have to. The work I have to send to Paris is giving me a lot of trouble and causes me to lead a life compared to which convicts have a leisurely time. <laughs> The idea I had was to compose a work in a very special color, which should cover a wide range of feelings. It is called printemps, not the descriptive printemps, but a human one. 
I should like to express the slow and miserable birth of beings and things in nature, their gradual blossoming, and finally the joy of being born into some new life. All this is without a program, for I despise all music that has to follow some literary text that one happens to have got hold of. So you will understand how very suggestive the music will have to be. I am doubtful if I shall be able to do it as I wish. Now, a couple of things that I think that I'd like to point out is some of the ways that he talks about this. He talks about it having color. He talks about it that it has a range of feelings, and he talks about it as being suggestive. And these things carry through in his music and into Impressionism in music throughout. He is always concerned with texture and color in his music. And in fact, Debussy is the first person that I can think of that elevates the idea of texture and color to be as important as harmony or melody or rhythm. And so he is already, in a, as a young man in his early 20s, concerned with all of this. And so he sends off the score uh, to the Paris Conservatoire, and they have this to say about it. And this is number two. His feeling for musical color is so strong that he is apt to forget the importance of accuracy and of line and form. He should beware this vague impressionism, which is one of the most dangerous enemies of artistic <laughs> truth. So I want to play a little bit of this piece for you. If you remember, he's talking about color. This is the second iteration, so it's without the chorus. Um, and what I think is really interesting is some of his color combinations in the orchestra. For instance, he starts out with flute. Debussy loves the flute, but he doubles it with other instruments. He also has some really interesting, there's a, an emphasis on the winds here. There's also, what I love, is piano four hands. And so that kind of percussive quality of the piano will come out in the way that he colors this music. I also want you to notice when he says, this is, um, he says, I want to express the slow and miserable birth. I don't think this sounds miserable, but you, you can, you can, uh, make up your own minds. Here's the very opening of that piece that he sent back. stop it there. I think you heard those pia that piano four hands. Um, you heard a real emphasis on the winds. Uh, and one of the other things that's very interesting to me, especially about Debussy's music, is that for me, Debussy is the first composer to liberate the winds and the other instruments from the dominance of the strings. If you listen to a Beethoven symphony or a Brahms symphony or a Richard Strauss even, um, the strings are pretty much sawing away all the time. String players, especially young string players, have a very hard time playing Debussy because they now have to count rests. And, <laughs> and I, I don't mean that snarkily, but I think it's true because all of a sudden, the first violinists are often accompaniment rather than the melody. And so all of a sudden, what they've been taught up until that, that time is, is very different. And that's evident here. Now, 
other than being that, that birth, let me just play a little bit of what I think he was talking about of um, when he says uh, the calling into being and the, finally the joy of being born into some new life. So here's just one of his kind of beautiful moments and here we go. It's gonna be a little loud. Notice he's still using the same tune from the beginning. to turn it off <laughs> and but if you notice it's kind of like this birth and it keeps coming up and then coming back down and the way that he uses the brass and and the percussion it's it's just so finely done and it's for someone from uh, who's in their early 20s sending this back and kind of getting shot down by the academy um, but again we're lucky because he doesn't pay any attention and in, at the very end of his time, at the very end of his two years, he writes this to a friend. He says, I've had enough of Rome, the eternal city. I want to see some Manet. <laughs> <clears throat> when he gets back to Paris, what's interesting is Debussy frequents galleries and arts, uh, and he, he collects art, actually, and he loves it. But he also befriends a lot of the symbolist poets. And he becomes friends with Stefan Mallarmé, for, for instance. Um, and he starts writing about the new way that he wants his music to go. And this is a little bit of a long quote, but I think it's really important. He says, quote, I voluntarily painted for myself, this is his own words, a delicious state of a man visited by a great dream in an absolute solitude, but a solitude with an immense horizon and a broadly diffuse light. Immensity without decor other than itself, soon I experienced the sensation of a livelier irradiation of an intensity of light that grew with such rapidity that the shades of meaning in a dictionary would not suffice to express this constantly renewed sense of heat and whiteness. And then I conceived a, plan, a plane, the idea of a soul in motion in a luminous medium, of an ecstasy formed out of sensuality and consciousness hovering far above the natural world. Now, he is not describing art, and he's not describing, I don't know, he's, he's not describing being drunk. He's describing his music. And he's describing it in some really interesting ways. He's describing it as fantasy released from the gravity of the concrete world. He's describing it in terms of colors. He's talking about the heat and whiteness. He's talking about hovering outside of his body. He's talking also about sensuality. And for me, one of the great things about music is that it is a sensual medium. It comes to us in, into our ears and it, and it makes us feel these very um, intense feelings in a way that we can't really put into words. 
Have you ever had that sensation of listening to a piece of music? And it doesn't matter what kind of music it is. It could be popular music or orchestral music, it doesn't matter. But you are so moved by it. And if someone had stopped you right there and said, How are, what are you feeling? You would not be able to put that into words. That's the sensation that Debussy is trying to evoke in you as a listener and what he's trying to write into his own music. It is extraordinarily calculated music, even though it sounds at times almost improvised and almost, um, uh, almost as if it was easy. And I think that's the sign of great music. Um, it is also a way of describing the symbolist poets as well. This sensuality, this idea that the symbolist poets were trying to get you into a mood state and that with their poetry they were attempting to have you remain in that sensation of awe or sensation of sorrow or sensation, some kind of sensation for a while and that they were doing it through sensual means. One of the sensual means is that at times they cared more about the sounds of words than they did their actual meaning, which means that it's extraordinarily difficult to translate um, because sometimes they chose words specifically for those sounds. And he, in fact, becomes great friends with Mallarmé. And I thought I'd give you the Mallarmé um, painting as painted by Gauguin. Uh, and that's, it's a beautiful, beautiful painting of him. They converse a lot. They hang out in, in uh, cafes and talk about art and talk about poetry. And Debussy sets lots and lots of songs, especially in the 1880s. So I thought that I would um, provide you, instead of just hearing me talk and recorded music, as Debussy would have said, live music is always the best. And um, I thought that I would uh, ask uh, a former student of mine uh, and a uh, pianist to come and we are gonna do some songs for you. The first song was written in 1884, the year he got back from the Prix de Rome. And I have given you at the end of this the words because Debussy always starts with words first. And we're going to... Um, and Aaron and Lindsay, I'd like to introduce you to them. And, uh, and it's going to be the first uh, Debussy here, Apparition. And you can follow along. I love some of Mallarmé's, um, the way that he evokes the moon was saddened, seraphims in tears, dreaming. dreaming. Um, so, right after number nine on, it is the first, and it says just lyrics. And take it away, Aaron and Lindsay.
He also particularly loves uh, the poetry of Paul Verlaine, and we're going to get to to some of that in a minute. But one of the other things that happens in Paris just around this time is the World's Fair. And of course, I'm sure you know that the Eiffel Tower was built for the World's Fair. Here's the exposition uh, poster. Here's the painting of how it was. All of those buildings had different uh, countries in them and they showed their uh, music and art and dance and also their cuisine and all different uh, things. Debussy particularly fell in love um, with the Javanese music that he heard there and it was it, it, it was a very important part uh, in his, a part of his development. This is a picture of the actual gamelan. And if you haven't heard gamelan music, um, if you notice, there's different size gongs here. In the front, it's small and they're high. Towards the back, it's middle. And then in the way back, they're larger. And they are all tuned. The gamelan is considered just one instrument, basically. They're all tuned slightly different so that you get this kind of shimmering texture to them. We also have uh, various planes of music going on at the same time. There'll be a low, kind of slow melody, and then a middle, sort of faster one that intertwines with that, and then a top. And I thought I would just play a little bit of this because he really had never heard anything like it before. What's interesting to me is that nowadays we are absolutely so used to having everything that we could possibly want at our fingertips. Um, I feel like listening to Elvis Presley and then I want to listen to some Beethoven and I can just go to Spotify and get both any time that I want. Um, I can look at any journal article in, at four in the morning from my desktop computer, those kinds of things. It's just unfathomable to us that Debussy had never heard anything like this. We've been, become so global and so, um, as John Cage would, would say, omnipresent. Um, but Debussy really just loved this. And this is what he said to a friend. Do you remember the Javanese music able to express every shade of meaning, even unmentionable shades, which make our tonic and dominant seem like ghosts? 
And what's interesting about that is tonic and dominant are, are simply, um, if you're in C major, a tonic chord with, would be a C major chord and dominant would be the G. And in common practice period, which is where we are from, let's say, 1600 on, um, you know, if you start in C major, you then move to G at some point, and then you come back to C major. Beethoven does it, Mozart does it, Brahms does it. As we get into the 19th century, where you go in between starts to expand and expand. And here, Debussy is basically saying, you know what, this does not, even the expansion of our tonic and dominant is not giving me all of the shades of the things that I want to express. So I thought I would play a little bit of Javanese music for you in case you haven't heard it. And I want you to notice those layers, how the music is kind of layered, how um, it sounds very, very different and in some ways sounds melodic and static at the same time. So what's interesting about that is that Debussy starts to really turn towards the east. He starts looking at um, Japanese music. He starts writing uh, music with those kind of um, layers in them. And he also starts using much more the idea of a pentatonic scale. Now a pentatonic scale when you're a little kid um, and you just play on the black keys of the keyboard, that's the pentatonic scale. And so he starts really using this scale. The reason why that this scale sounds so foreign to us is that it has really no leading tone to let's say our C major. So what I mean by that is if you if I were to sing this to you, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, and you all want me to go do, <laughs> ti is our leading tone, and it gets us back to our tonic. Um, and Debussy begins to think, why does it have to go to tonic? Why do we have to have these leading tones? Let's give them something else to concentrate on other than these harmonies that kind of force you to go certain directions. And so what's interesting about that is when he is listening to all of this, he's thinking about harmony in a new way. He's also reading a lot of symbolist poetry. And one of the most fascinating things for me is when a composer goes back and sets the same poem more than once. Because now you think, he, okay, he's now come to a different conclusion about what he wants to do. So what I thought I would do is with Paul Verlaine's Claire de Lune, he sets that before he hits, before he sees this, and then he sets it again afterwards. And I think that you can see this expansion of color, an expansion of the way that he describes, uh, especially with texture. And so I'm going to invite Aaron and Lindsay to come up, and they're just going to play a little bit of the first iteration of Claire de Lune. Again, right after this is, um, I'm, unfortunately, the whole, luckily the whole thing is on the next page. Your soul is a chosen landscape where charming masquerades and dancers are promenading. And so um, he sets it, and they're just gonna do a little bit of the first iteration of this, and then they're going to do post-Javanese. Okay, first one. Oh, <laughs> 
that's the way the first iteration goes. He wrote that in 1882. Then he hears all of this, and then he and he starts to contemplate other things, and he does this one. And um, I think they're going to do the entire uh, song, second iteration. And this is in a group of uh, songs that he put together called Fet Galant. I just want to make sure, not, not you, Aaron, but I just want to make sure that you heard how that opening is so, it sounds like the black keys on the keyboard, just, just that little opening. It's really evoking a place far away. Thank you. I love this, having a pianist at my disposal. <laughs> it's fantastic. I should just walk around with a pianist all the time. Um, but I think that, and this, the second iteration, the first was 1882, he returns to it in 1891. This, this was two years after he had heard this. And that quote was actually from a, um, a letter that he had written two years after. And he's still talking about the Javanese music that he had heard and how it kind of really made him rethink some of the things that he was doing. He then, uh, he then turns back to um, Mallarmé for what I think is his first absolute complete masterpiece. Um, for me, the prelude to the afternoon of a fawn is in the top 10 pieces of all time. Um, and I've given you, it's a fairly long poem. <clears throat> this is for the 1876 publication it's drawn by Manet, and for each, it was hand-colored so they could save money. 
Um, and so that little bit of the fawn and all that, each one Manet actually colored himself. I've only given you a little bit of the poem um, and I thought that I would just talk a little bit about what I think is particularly interesting about Debussy's take on it. Here's from the very, very opening of the poem. Those nymphs, I want to make them permanent. So clear, their light flesh pink, it hovers on the atmosphere. Was it a dream I loved? My doubt accumulated through the night, branches out to many a fine point, no more in fact than twigs, proving alas, that what I'd claimed for trophy by myself was only my imagination's lack of roses. Let us think. Might not the girls you are describing be wishful fragments of your, my, sorry, mythopedic senses? Fawn, your illusion flies from that shy girl's blue eyes, cool as a weeping spring, the other one all sighs. Does she make, say, a contrast like today's faint breeze, warm on your fleece? Oh no, this enervating swoon of heap, heat which stifles all fresh dawn's resistance allows no splash of water but that which my flute pours into cord-besprinkled thickets. And it goes on. And if you read this um, and the entire thing, Mallarmé is very, very careful in this first publication for size of font, where in fact the words are on the page, if they're italicized, if they're slightly larger, smaller, and it all matters. The other thing is that if you have, and I, I do all the time, ask my students to read this and ask them, what is this all about? They will look at you and if some of them clue in, they don't want to say. And if some of them don't clue in, they're just blank. And if you, if you really read it, you can read this on many, many different levels. And the first level is that the fawn is in between sleep and wakefulness. And he is basically having an erotic dream. And he's dreaming of catching the nymphs and their flesh and their pink flesh. And, he's, and it's, I'm, I'm sure that you have had the experience of almost being awake and having a very, very vivid dream right before you wake up. And it's really as if you have experienced it. That is what Mallarmé is trying to encapsulate in this entire thing, that fraction of a second that you have those absolutely vivid, vivid dreams. That's number one. Number two is, throughout the poem, what he's trying to do is elongate that sensation to get you into that mood state. Because as you know, that very, very important dream that you've just had, that very vivid dream, only lasts a second. And then you sit there in your bed and you try to capture it and hold on to those dreams every once in a while. And you, you, you find it hard, it's almost elusive, it, it, it starts to go away. But on another level, and on a level that I think Debussy also wrote and, and, and responded to this, is, when is, is the question of when a piece of art is created. Because after all, this poem is about waking, it's about kind of trying to capture. And the moment when art is created, when is that moment? Uh, is it that moment of wakefulness? Is it that moment that you have this idea and then come to fruition? And I think Debussy is responding to that. He writes this in 1894 and it's premiered. And Mallarmé himself wrote Debussy and said, you have, you have uncovered all of the nuances that I had wanted. You've done an, an amazing job. What is great about this piece, it's only about 10 minutes long, but what Debussy was, was doing is taking his clues uh, from the poem itself. 
So for instance, it says, except for my pipes blown empty long before it could have scattered notes in parching rain. Um, we start with flute. And in fact, we start with a flute that's very low and in a mode that we have no idea what key we're in until way later in the piece. That that little low flute keeps coming back over and over and over again, kind of keeping us into, in that mood state. The other uh, thing that he, that he does is he, he gives us this kind of big wellspring in the middle and then we come back to that flute. In number six, he got a, a letter asking what this was all about. And he says this in October 10th, 1896. He says, the prelude to the afternoon of a fawn. Now the original poem is simply called the afternoon of a fawn. Um, Debussy had actually thought that he would write a prelude and then several movements. And when he was done with the prelude, he said, no, this, this encapsulates this poem exactly. I'm not gonna write anymore. So he says, the prelude to the afternoon of of a fawn, cher monsieur, is it perhaps the dream left over at the bottom of the fawn's flute? To be more precise, it is the general impression of the poem. Just, just think that he's using the term impression again. If the music were to follow it more closely, it would run out of breath, like a, a dray horse competing for the Grand Prix with a thoroughbred. It also demonstrates the, the, a disdain for the constructional know-how which is a burden upon our finest intellects. And then again, it has no respect for tonality. Rather, it's in a mode which is intended to contain all the nuances. I can give you a perfectly logical demonstration of this. And then he goes on in his typical cheeky way. He says, all the same, it follows the ascending shape of the poem as well as the scenery so marvelously described in the text together with the humanity brought to it by 32 violinists who have gotten up too early. <laughs> as for the ending, it's a prolongation of the last line. Couple, farewell. I go to see what you became. And I'd like to just play a little bit of it for you. But if you notice a couple of the things that he says, he says a disdain for the constructional know-how. This is extremely carefully constructed, but what he's really talking about is constructional know-how of traditional harmony and traditional form. And what he's also talking about is those nuances. He says it's in a mode or a tonality that is going to give you all those nuances. And I want you to remember this. When he says it's able to express every shade of meaning, even unmentionable shades, this is exactly what he's talking about in Afternoon of a Fawn. So I'm gonna play the opening. Again, I'd like you to notice how the instrumentation the very opening is <clears throat> flute, horn, and harp. And then my favorite thing that a composer can do, silence. And whenever a composer gives you silence, sit up and pay attention um, because it's great. Okay, <laughs> so, and then wait, just, just wait till you see when he starts using when he starts using all of the strings.
It's so beautiful. Um, I'm just going to play a, just a little bit from the middle um, when the fawn is in the midst of his dream and, um, <clears throat> and it's really in an ABA form. So we start with that beautiful low flute, so unusual. Um, and as a, a former flutist myself, I've played this. It's very difficult uh, because it's very low and low flute is generally very soft. Um, and uh, the way that he uses it is such a new and interesting color. Usually we get to play birds and things like that. Um, okay, so I thought I'd play just a little bit. So, I mean, he manages to get colors out of the orchestra unlike anyone else. Um, and especially after his death, he died in 1918, in the 20s and 30s, oftentimes composers actually reorchestrated Debussy to make it easier on the orchestra to play. And that is an absolute abomination. Um, so don't do that. Um, this, this piece actually really did catapult him into the uh, public eye. Everyone talked about it. But he still hung out uh, in Paris cafes, and he hung out in Paris cafes, especially with this guy. This is a picture taken um, in Debussy's house. I want you to notice the Buddha in the middle. Um, Debussy was always going and trying to collect art, sculpture, and, and even though he didn't have a lot of money, that's what he spent money on, good man. And he became friends with Eric Satie. Now Satie was a bit of an outsider. In number seven, I've given you uh, this little um, sketching uh, that was made of both Debussy and uh, Satie in 1896 um, while they were hanging out in, um, at their favorite joints. Though these were their two favorite joints. Um, one here, and there is a piano in the side, and then Chat Noir, especially. Um, and Eric Satie was a very interesting guy, got kicked out of the Paris Conservatoire in his transcript. It said, the laziest student we've ever had. <laughs> um, and uh, he had no use for conservatory until he was about 40 and he went back to the Schola Cantorum at the beginning of the 20th century and did an even, uh, in some ways, more rigorous uh, plan of action for a student. However, um, he made money by playing piano in some of these clubs, and uh, Debussy would often frequent them. And he could be seen there with friends of his who were poets or artists, um, and they became actually quite close. Um, here's another picture, and this is exactly the way that we should be listening to Aaron. Um, we should all have red wine in our hand. It should be very smoky in here, and we should all be kind of in hats and mustaches. Um, but this is there, and I want you to notice right in the front, 
uh, right, right here is the piano, right front and center. Um, Satie would often play kind of background music. And what's interesting about that is that it is some of his most enduring and popular pieces. I think you've heard this. It's absolutely beautiful. Debussy liked it so much, and for me, it's the quintessential anti-German uh, music, because in the 19th century, Germanic music really dominated Europe, absolutely, except for Italian opera, um, really dominated Europe. And um, German, German music is all about arrival in various places, you know, you're, you're heading off someplace, you're going to come back to a recapitulation. It's all about developing motives. It's all about interconnecting. It's all about, if you think about Brahms's music, taking little bits of musical material and growing that musical material in this gorgeous, gorgeous piece. Um, this is anti that. It doesn't change. We just keep repeating. It's circular. It's vaguely dissonant, and it doesn't go anywhere. Germanic music, no matter where, goes someplace, we arrive somewhere. Whether it's Mahler or Strauss or Beethoven or Mozart, it arrives. This just kind of sets the tone and repeats. Debussy liked it so much and thought it such a, an impressive work that he orchestrated it. And when a composer like Debussy does that, you should listen for it. So this is what he did. I think he transforms it in, in some ways, and he adds so many more colors, and also more um, movement, uh, especially when he has the harp playing. He has all of this movement when there wasn't, when it was a much more static piece. And I think he kind of transforms it. It's, it's, it they're two different animals. One of the things about Satie that everyone comments on, and I think is true, is that he was very, he never really took himself that seriously. Uh, and he was always forging ahead and doing very unusual types of pieces. Um, I gave you just one example of his wit. He was once asked by a newspaper um, to talk about his day. And this is what he wrote, and this is number eight. A Musician's Day, an artist must organize his life. Here is the exact timetable of my daily activities. I rise at 7.18 a.m., inspired from 10.23 to 11.47. I lunch at 12.11 and leave the table at 12.14. A healthy ride on horseback round my domain follows from 1.19 to 2.53 p.m. Another bout of inspiration from 3.12 to 4.07 p.m. From 4.27 to 6.67 p.m. Various occupations, fencing, reflection, immobility, visits, contemplation, dexterity, nation-nation. Dinner is served at 7.16 and finished at 7.20. 
from 8.09 to 9.59 p.m., symphonic readings out loud. I go to bed regularly at 10.37. I wake up with a start at 3.19 on Tuesdays. <laughs> My other favorite thing is he wrote a series of, uh, he wrote a set of three piano pieces. Both he and Debussy were pianists. Debussy was a, a really fine pianist. And uh, Satie gave it to Debussy and said, uh, so, so what do you think of these pieces? And remember, Debussy is the one who says, oh, I don't like form, and I want to blur form, and all that kind of stuff. And um, so Debussy says to him, you know, these pieces are great, but they really need more form. <laughs> and so Satie took them back, uh, did not change a thing, and the title of the work is Three Pieces in the, Sh in the Form of a Pair. And it's because the first one is the smallest, the second one is larger, and the third one is the largest. <clears throat> but he also wrote songs. And he wrote songs to play in places like this. And if you can, please imagine yourself holding a glass of wine. Aaron and Lindsay are going to play one of those. And that's going to be the Diva of the Empire. And compare and contrast with the Debussy, this is kind of showing you different sides of listening in Paris.
see what I mean about the, you know, the red wine and the smoke? <laughs> exactly. Um, I just want to bring up one more piece, and I know I'm running out of time because we have to have time for just questions or comments. Um, but I thought I would bring up this painting, um, the Whistler Nocturne in Blue and Silver from 1871. Um, Debussy saw these paintings, and he was really um, taken by them. And in a lot of ways, he writes about this, and what particularly struck him was how this is all shades of the same color, and how you can truly feel this landscape. And he starts to write an orchestral piece um, that he calls Nocturnes. Now, Whistler has a whole series of nocturnes. Uh, Blue and Silver is just one, but that's one of the ones that Debussy really likes. There's a whole bunch of others. And they're kind of, um, he calls his pieces nocturnes. There's three movements. But the first one he describes, and if you think about this painting, and think about what Debussy is saying in number nine. He says, the title Nocturnes is to be interpreted here in a general and more particularly in a decorative sense. Now there are nocturnes in music. There are piano pieces. You might know some of the nocturnes by Chopin. It was a, um, a type of piano piece actually um, invented by John Field, an Irish uh, pianist, and then Chopin heard them and wrote well, better ones. Um, and what Debussy says is, don't think about the Chopin, but think about a kind of a decorative and a general idea. Therefore, it is not meant to designate the usual form of the nocturne, but rather all the various impressions, there's that word again, and the general effects of light that the word suggests. Nuage renders the immutable aspect of the sky and the slow, solemn motion of the clouds fading away in gray tones, lightly tinged with white. And so, especially on a day like today, when it should be warm and sunny and lovely, and when Boston is often gray and cloudy, just look up and if you ever see a really gray sky, Pay attention to it just like Debussy does, because when he looks, he doesn't just see gray. He sees shades of gray, and sometimes the little white, uh, fast-moving cloud that moves across, and maybe there's a darker cloud behind it, and all the different kinds of shades of gray. And also, what he's trying to do in this piece is give you a sensation of stasis, of getting you into that mood of looking at a completely gray sky. And then every once in a while, and I think it's in the English horn, we get that little bit of white and that white cloud that's faster than all the others. And that if you notice that it's not, it's all gradations of sensual gray. And I thought I'd just play the very opening. Again, listen for the fact that it is um, <clears throat> it is dominated by the winds.
don't know about you, but that piece is just very lonely to me. Um, there's something very, um, I think it's the hollowness of the chords that he uses and how they're constantly shifting but not moving anywhere. And it, it gives you that sense of, of being alone. And what Debussy actually says, what I read you before when he comes back from Rome and he says, this is what I'm trying to do in Paris in the later 19th century, when he says, it is a solitude with an immense horizon and a broadly diffuse light. And I think that he achieves that here. And he also achieves that in a lot of his other music and really forever changes uh, music history. And I think that where it is an exciting time in the end of the 19th century where art and poetry and music kind of coincide and they all try to give you a sensual fantasy of what life is. So thank you. Um, and um, if, if there's any questions or comments, I'd be happy to take them. But before you leave, before you leave, if there aren't very many questions and comments, we do have one more song. See, I'm sneaky that way. <laughs> All right, does anyone have any, any questions? Um, and raise your hand so we can get a microphone to you. Oh my goodness. Okay, well is that good or bad? I don't know. Okay. I may have imagined it, but in uh, La Diva de l'Empire, um, it sounded like there was some Ragtime. Yes, absolutely. Okay. There was some ragtime, um, and in fact, um, in in a, in Paris at this time, everyone is getting very, very excited about the ragtime that's coming over from the United States, and especially in kind of the cafes, not in the concert halls, not in what Debussy was doing. Even though he wrote a, a great piano piece called Gollywog's Cakewalk. And it's, if, if you should, you should uh, oh, I wonder if I, I don't know if I'm connected to the internet, but you, you would, um, let's see if I can be. Yes, absolutely, ragtime. Jazz also later on in the century, the Parisians were very, very open to that. Um, the, uh, and in fact, in Gollywog's Cakewalk, my favorite thing about Gollywog's Cakewalk is that it is Debussy being ragtimey, and then in the middle of it, he, plants this whole bit making fun of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde. I mean, and it's unmistakable. And then he has the piano going doop, 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 like laughter, and then goes back to Gollywog's cakewalk. So yes, so what the other thing, and I'm glad you brought this up, and especially why I wanted to, to play you some Satie, was that the lines, and I think that this is true in 20th century music anyways, but the lines between what is popular music and what is art music start to become erased. Um, even at this time, at the same time actually that Debussy is writing Nocturnes, um, Mahler is writing Symphony Number no. One, and even Mahler is putting klezmer music smack dab in his in his third uh, movement of his first symphony. And so, the, you know, we've had folk tunes and whatnot, but they've always been transformed into art music. Now we have composers composing art music using popular as inspiration and putting it in directly. Anything else? <clears throat> to what extent was uh, Manuel de Falla pursuing <laughs> any of these so Manuel, ideas? So Manuel de Falla, my, that's my dissertation. Um, I, uh, my original dissertation title was Manuel de Falla's Years in Paris. Um, oh, no, the original title was Impressionism as... Um, interpreted by a Spanish national. And um, my uh, dissertation committee didn't like the term Impressionism, so my title is now 
Manuel de Falla's years in Paris, 1907 to 1914. <laughs> um, but basically, Manuel de Falla was a little um, frustrated in Spain because he wasn't getting his um, uh, art music out and able be, to be performed. And he actually had in, in hand an opera that he had written called La Vida Breve. And he shows up in Paris in 1907 and decides to stay and spends a lot of time actually with Debussy. And Debussy writes him all the things how to fix his opera and, and all that. And actually, if you know any of Manuel de Falla's uh, works, one of the most beautiful, I think, is Nights in the Gardens of Spain. It's a gorgeous work, and he actually started writing that while he was living in Paris, and Debussy was the one who said, this should be piano and orchestra, not just piano. So he, he learned a lot from the Impressionists, but he was slightly after 1907 to 1914. <laughs> oh, Gollywog, yeah. Do you want to hear Gollywog? Yeah. Oh, you can play it? <laughs> Lindsay Abbott is going to be following me around. Technology amazing. <laughs> she pulled that out, out uh, from her phone. Oh my goodness. Uh, I don't know if is it. I guess this is yes. No question. Yes. Up here, in the middle. Oh, huh, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I, yeah, <laughs> yes. That's right. Um, uh, I noticed the absence uh, of what I would have considered to be a uh, uh, not a similar uh, composer. Ravel. But, uh, well, I was thinking of Faure. Oh, Faure. And Faure was certainly an anti-German in the sense of the Absolutely. type of music. Uh, did you leave him out because you had plenty to do? <clears throat> I'll tell you why I left him out. I, okay, so Faure. First of all, let me, let me I thought you were going to uh, complain about Ravel. Um, <laughs> Ravel is kind of the next generation. He's born in 75, and I don't think of Ravel as being particularly Impressionist. Um, I think that he's, uh, he's kind of very different in approach. Faure, I would agree with you, and Faure is uh, uh, one of the most important people at the end of the 19th century, and definitely very anti-German, and definitely wrote some absolutely gorgeous songs. Uh, he is also an important person. He takes over the Paris Conservatoire in the first decade of the, of the 20th century and, and um, continues. I'll tell you why I didn't include him, and perhaps I should next time. So come back next week. Um, <laughs> is because the reason, there's so much to say about Debussy, and it was, I, I took it as a springboard for my talk, um, the, uh, the term Impressionism, which was not leveled at Faure, and in fact, no one ever, ever called him that, and no one ever complained about his music in quite the same way that they did Debussy. Um, and so, therefore, I kind of wanted to show Impressionism. I brought in Satie because I wanted to show how we have kind of the popular coming in as well. So that was how I crafted it. I could easily have included Faure or Chabrier or, you know, others. And, of course, good old Ravel, too, later. Um, yes. Okay, uh, you mentioned uh, Nuage under Nocturne. Now there was a famous jazz piece by Django Reinhardt called Nuage, and uh, any uh, connection? I don't know of any connection there. I have to look that up. I really, I am not sure. You've stumped me. Thank you, but I, I will look it up. Um, I think that if we have four minutes left, I think we should hear another song.
And you do, ha and you do have the words, the very last set. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon.